Welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'm Catherine Wygamp Fawcett, the Executive Director of the Institute for Family Owned Business, otherwise known as IFOB or IFOB. We have Brooke Stewart, our Director of Communications with us too. She's in the picture there with the fun hat. Um, we're so excited to have you here as we kick off our new online series called Navigating the Remote World. And the IFOB has been remote since I joined eight years ago. So everybody always thinks that that we have um, an office, but I said it's a little bit like um, the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the screen. <laughs> and, and I come to you from uh, not, my, not my attic, but from my home in Booth Bay and Brooke is coming in from down in Livington and Andrea from Old Orchard Beach. So we we're kind of remote and know this world. So it's fun to share a new series with you guys on this. Thank you to Masshead Maine for sponsoring this series with us. We've muted everyone and we'll turn off your video in a minute so we can focus on the presentation. We'll be recording this program for later viewing. We'll also share the slides after the program and some resources. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. So please send us your questions in the chat feature or raise your hand like Carrie did. Um, here at the IFOB, we promote support and champion the success of family owned businesses, the backbone of our economy with education, networking, and other services. This year, we're offering over 60 programs, both online, in-person, and hybrid. Check out our website, famfambusiness.org, for full details. These programs are for all your employees, so it's much all you want, like Dorita. So <laughs> welcome, everybody, to come and hear our programs. Um, and if you know anybody else who you think might benefit from them, even if they're not members, it's, it's open to all. And right now is nominations for our main family business awards. If you'd please go to our website to nominate a family business. If you do, they'll know that you recognize them for their excellence and save the date for Wednesday, October 12th for our awards gala. We'll have fifth generation retired CEO, Tony Simmons from Tabasco Sauce as our guest speaker. So we're gonna spice it up at the Holiday Inn. And we'll have Amanda Hill, news anchor from New Center, Maine, as our host. So check out our website um, to register for any of these programs or chat with Brooke and myself. And now I have to be Vanna and turn the next slide. Here we go. Hope that worked. Yes. So today um, we kick off this series from big tech to main tech, a behind the scenes look at navigating in a remote world. We have husband and wife team, Melinda Gagnon, CEO, and Brian Gagnon, CTO from Uprise Partners, who are joining us. Uh, you'll hear about how they are building a thriving and sustainable business with a great culture after working with big tech giants, how they navigate the demands of a growing business, how they make it work as business partners and life partners, and some quick tips and tools so you can use this in your own business. Our next program in this series is about three weeks away. It's cybersecurity, cyber insurance, fraud, and crisis mitigation for your company, which will be on Thursday, June 23rd, from around this time from 12 to 1.30ish, right here on Zoom. We'll have Dave Hodgkins, Portsmouth Computer Group, Tim Fort from Clark Insurance, and Shelly Prey from Bangor Savings Bank. And we'll have one of our favorites, Derek Volk from Volk Packaging, who says dealing with cybersecurity is like going to the dentist, but you need to do it. <laughs> so he'll be here to tell you about that. Um, and we'll talk about cybersecurity threats and events in the headlines. In the fall, we'll pick up this series back with recruitment and retention in a remote and live world. The speakers will be Tani Alvarez from Vero. Dana and Marie O'Neill from Retail Association of Maine. And we'll have two family business panelists. We'll have Paige Hartman from Kittery Trading Post and Danielle Hansen from uh, PA and Bookkeeping and Business Services. And our final in this series will be on Tuesday, December 6th with a look at new ways of marketing your business in 2023 with Jesse Fowler from OSC Web Design and Marie Stewart Harmon of Lisa Marie's Made in Maine. Towards the end of the program, we'll ask you to please fill out a quick survey that we'll put in the chat. Your feedback is really important to us and it's how we develop and curate our programs each year. I will now toss it over to Melinda and Brian. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, for the introduction. We're really happy to be here today. And um, you know, we, we thought a lot about what we could talk about today because there is so, so much that we could dive into from 
you know, our journey, as Catherine mentioned, from being at big tech companies to how we started our journey here with Uprise and, and starting our business back in Maine. Um, so we wanted to give a high level trip down mem memory lane. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, we'll hit the highlights on how we got to the world's biggest tech companies and how we got to where we are today, sitting in Bethel, Maine, running our own tech company. And um, then talk a little bit about how, how we grew our company here in Maine and, and what's worked for us and what we've had challenges with. And then want to wrap up with you know, some tips that we have in terms of, you know, tech for your business, things to think about in managing a remote team. And, you know, since this is the kickoff to this, this great series that Catherine mentioned, you know, giving a few little uh, snippets for what you can expect to dive in deeper with in those next sessions. So, so yeah, so where do you want to start? I guess uh, we, like you said, we don't want to go back too far. But uh, we're both Mainers. We could start there and yeah. kind of just how we, we got to Google VMware and yeah. kind of fast forward. I'm going to go first or second? You go first. Okay. So obviously, we do this a bunch. We have a podcast. So we spend a lot of time talking back and forth to each other in, you know, good ways. Uh, and so what I would say is uh, when I think back on my career, um, I feel pretty gifted to have gotten to the point that... Uh, that I'm at at this point where we're building a business in Maine, uh, never actually thought that I would do this. Um, I grew up in Rumford, uh, it's kind of interesting. I actually started doing tech when I was in the third or fourth grade uh, because there was, you know, somebody donated a bunch of computers. I went to a small private school and none of the teachers understood a thing about computers. And luckily my dad worked at Central Maine Community College and was able to bring home equipment really early. So I was writing code and playing around with computers when I was probably in the second or third grade. Then they said, hey, could you help out with this? You know computers, right? And then that sort of was the start of my career. In middle school and high school, I ended up running uh, some of the computer systems at Mountain Valley. Uh, and it was really neat because I would get called out of class when there was a problem and someone would have to drive me uh, somewhere and I'd fix the computer systems and then I'd go back to class. So uh, that's really where it all began for me. And then you had a, a role in the University of Maine early systems too, right? Yeah. So I also helped build out the Maine school and library network from the middle and high school side. And then when I went to the University of Maine, uh, they hired me on for the system and, you know, building the network there. Uh, after that, I went, worked for Microsoft for three weeks, decided I didn't really love that. And I didn't really love Seattle because it's basically Maine with a ton of rain. So uh, made my way back, worked for uh, Bath Iron Works, a computer sciences corporation, and uh, you know, kind of started my career there. At that point, I got a job offer that I couldn't refuse and migrated to Boston for a while and then out into big tech. And then for the last 20 years, 20 years or so, I've uh, spent most of my career in California, um, commuting around the world. So, and, you know, and, and talking with, with Catherine and, and Brooke before the session and, and with a lot of people too, the question always comes up, oh, wait, you're both from Maine. How, how did you get together? How did this all happen? Because I I'm from Bethel. So, you know, just South of Rumford and we actually met in high school ski racing for, for rival ski teams. So that was big big deal but so met back then then didn't know what each other was doing for 11 years and got back together and the crazy thing about it when we wound up you know re-meeting at that time Brian was with VMware and he can tell you like you know a couple of the highlights about VMware and I was at Google and you know the the funny way that <laughs> the world works you know going from rural Maine to ending up being in Boston and we would actually commute to work together because we worked in the same building. So we'd go in, I'd get off on the fourth floor, Brian would go to the 11th floor and, you know, Google and VMware were just, you know, companies in the same building. And it was, it was a, a really cool time. Um, do you want to talk a little about VMware and then I can give a few Google highlights and. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So VMware, uh, one of the, you know, uh, Forbes magazine, a number of places have said, 
uh, one of the most transformational technology companies um, as far as moving from the mainframe and all the computers and servers and really like allowing that to collapse down. Uh, I was the global architect for VMware. So that meant I got to travel the world and I, I love travel, um, but I've since the last 20 years, I've been putting in 400 to 600,000 air miles a year, which is insanity, honestly. So uh, starting a business and working with Melinda uh, on the day to day, some people say, how could you guys do it? Uh, for me, it's great because we figured we figured out how to make it work. It's great because, you know, we get to uh, spend a lot more time together. And for the most part, that's a that's a great trade off from all of the travel. So, uh, but, you know, VMware, uh, I was fortunate. I've architected um, 91 of the Fortune 100. Um, between the two of us, we've built and architected stuff at um, 60, more than 60% 60 of the, the Fortune 500. So we're very, very fortunate to have been in the consulting roles that we were because we were able to get to so many broad, different types of companies. And so, and, you know, and to wind back just a little highlight about my time at Google. So that was really my, um, really my kind of breakout gig in, in tech certainly. And it was a, a wild time to be at Google because it was just a couple of years after they launched their first ad product. So it was very new. It was absolutely startup mode. And uh, I started with Google in Boston uh, in startup space. So we were in this, this tiny little room just at a big table together. And uh, I helped build their ad technology group. And it was it was just a very, very fast growth time. We quickly moved into the space that they're in today, uh, grew that team for a couple of years. And then um, basically, you know, my job was to help businesses use Google's technology to, to grow their businesses, which was absolutely a fun, fun job. And, you know, we learned so much about our time, you know, Google and VMware, not only in just loving technology and loving to figure out, well, how do you make technology work for a business, but how do you grow a company fast and in a way that people enjoy the growth? They enjoy, you know, the the challenge and the excitement that comes with that because it's not easy, right? Growing growth period, especially really fast growth. Um, so at Google, I was recruited by Google's largest customer. So then I went to work for the world's largest media holding company and uh, built out two different teams there. So it was kind of like a startup within a monstrous company. So um, they're digital consulting organizations so basically figuring out how to use data for, for different types of, of insights. And then uh, founded and led their first product and technology group. So uh, worked with Google, Amazon, Facebook to build uh, new communications products, did a lot of mergers and acquisitions. We did a lot of investing at that company and uh, did that for almost 10 years and then kind of realized like, hey, but let's let's think of what the next step is. And that was around the time that Brian was at Western Digital. So the world's largest storage company. Can they claim largest or one of the two largest? They are, they are the world's so largest storage right. company. So yeah, I went to Western Digital behind the scenes to buy SanDisk, which I think everybody knows those, the little USB keys. They've made a lot more than that. Uh, but I had a team of... Uh, 18,000 engineers or so uh, globally. So went to, uh, you know, my big boy job. And that was really interesting. We were doing a ton of really great stuff with tech. And then, you know, we could talk a little bit, talk about, let's talk about starting Uprise and yeah, kind of yeah. where we went. So, so basically, I mean, we, you know, had worked with all these um, Fortune 500 companies as customers. We'd grown these tech companies and we're really at this point in our careers that we're like, okay, what, what are we excited about next? And, and where do we see a big need? And that was really in the small, medium-sized business area, because when we looked at the type of technology support that these businesses had, we realized it was either one, incomplete, or two, just very fractured and really siloed. So for a you know small business, for example, to get help with, you know, having to make sure there's their uh, IT is secure, their information is secure, to make sure that they're productive and using tools that they want, to make sure their website is where it needs to be and is working for them, right, as an actual tool. You had to go to all these different firms. 
And that just wastes time and wastes money. So we said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could bring all that under one roof, right? We're, we're remote, but one proverbial roof and be able to be flexible. And we always want to be like business advisors first because you have to understand the business challenge. And that's what we love so much about what we get to do is say, okay, tell us, tell us what the issue is. Let's for, forget about the tools to do it. Forget about technology. Forget about anything. What do you need to do? What do you need to accomplish? And then we figure out the how, you know, and use technology to do it. So that was the big opportunity that we saw. And, you know, the early days of Uprise were very different than, than where we are today. And, and I'm sure a lot of you, you know, who have, have your own business can attest to that. You know, you have a vision, right? You see a need that you want to fill, but the how in terms of, of what you offer and maybe who you even offer that to evolves over time as you, as you hone it. Um, so, you know, early we were really a consulting firm. We were really, and we're also an investment actually, firm. Because <laughs> Melinda, Melinda started this and then lured me. I had one little tiny client. Uh, I, I intended to take time off after leaving WPP and how'd that work for you? I, I left on a Friday and I started with my first client on a Monday. I had no company up. I was, was not a thing. Uh, I just said, Oh yeah, sure. I'll help you out with this thing. And uh, it turns out they became the first Uprise client when I finally, three months later, named the company, incorporated it. Um, and then 2018 was really when we we started going and Brian joined in January of 2018. So um, then we, we you know, got our, our, well, our first hire in April of 2018. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, we started in consulting because that's a great model to start with because you do a project, you get paid for it. And look at that. You're already, you're already, you know, in the, in the black with, in terms of revenue. Uh, we also have uh, backgrounds in investing from our past roles. And so we also were, were interested in having some time to do that. So we also invested in some companies along the way and really what we wanted to get to was a different model. That's more repeatable, right? I mean, we all want that, right? We want repeatable revenue. We want to look ahead and be able to know what the future looks like. So interestingly, COVID actually kind of happened at the same time that we were looking to evolve our business in a different way. And lo and behold, it actually kind of worked. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about 2020 and what we were launching in terms of IT yeah. and kind of how that fit with COVID and a very strange turn of events. Well, yeah. And I wanted to like back up just one oh, yeah. second on Maine, right? So yeah. when we started this, it was, hey, let's just do consulting. Um, honestly, we didn't have the strongest business plan because we knew how to make consulting work. Mm -hmm. We knew how to scale that. It, it was one of those things. We both knew the metrics and that was really easy. We actually started out without a business plan, um, but it was it was comfort for us because we had done it before. One of the things that we didn't anticipate, and well, we actually did anticipate, we knew that starting something in Maine would be hard because the ecosystem, um, it's fragile for startups and tech companies and all that. And we had talked to a number of businesses and their idea of tech and our idea of tech and spending a lot of our career in California and in Silicon Valley was very different. So we quickly realized we're going to have to build some of this stuff and it's going to be really hard. Uh, and so we set off and, and that's what we started with. We couldn't really pull from either of our networks because most of our networks were, you know, Boston at the closest and, you know, California or somewhere global uh, at the furthest. So that presented some challenges. So we quickly realized, look, we need to start building a team and we need to start training people and, and doing some of those functions that take a little bit more time. And so when we thought about starting this and building it, we were thinking about those things. But then after a year or two, we started to realize, you know, we're really going to have to evolve so that we can, you know, take our team, also be remote with much of our team and we were already selling to the to the national market, so that was great. But when we think about uh, that transition point, I always call it the three-legged stool. So if you're doing consulting, that's one leg of the stool, and that's great, 
you know, you, but it's a lot of it is you sell a project, you work on a project, it ends, right? And then if you're lucky enough to kind of keep the flywheel going, that's great. Uh, but we recognize that's, that's a hard way to, you know, scale. So then we started building and talking about managed services because we could actually build a scalable model where we could help a lot more people and um, really build that out. And so we, we talked about marketing because we were doing marketing. We talked about business operations because we were consulting on that. The one thing we weren't doing was technology, which was interesting, meaning IT. Uh, but as we thought about it, we're like, why aren't we doing this? A lot of our, almost all of our customers were asking for help with that. And so we started coming up with a plan and this is basically January, 2020, we were getting ready to launch in February, 2020. So we were just a step ahead of COVID at that point. Uh, and then COVID happened, right? And so uh, we had to, like everybody else, um, change gears. But I think there was at one point in early March, we sort of, you know, we stopped traveling. Uh, we basically looked at each other and said, hey, we might have to go get real jobs. Than... Wait a second. Isn't this a real job? <laughs> no, what I mean, I it, it is, but we, we get to like pick the design of the t-shirts and things like that now and, and have like a lot more risk. But besides that, it's a real job, I guess. So, but with that being said, uh, we started to think like, boy, we need to cut our spend. We need to like be ready for the worst. We didn't know what COVID was. We started selling projects that cost, literally just saying, okay, that keeps this person's job and that person's job, just not knowing, right? Yeah. Not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. And we wanted to obviously keep, keep our team intact. Yeah. And yeah. And so we had kind of those hard discussions about like, what do we do? How do we navigate this? How bad might it get? And then we started doing financial calculations on what happens if X drops off and all these customers. Well, we were being very conservative, luckily, and our business actually went the other way. And so all the customers that we thought in our projections we were going to lose, um, you know, the worst case scenarios, it actually went the other way. And we never planned for that, which is just, honestly, it's almost as scary because we started to launch some new offerings and they started to take off. Almost all of our customers did more work with us. Well, and I think that's, you know, the the thing that we all, you know, think about as business owners, right? When there's something big that happens, there's there's a change. I mean, obviously like COVID, that's a huge change that we all feel, but a change in the industry, a change in what your customers are looking for and how do you respond? You know, for us, we saw that this IT offering that we were just, you know, getting out to the public happened. And this was the kind of fortuitous timing of it was what people really needed. Everyone was starting to go to rem go remote and things were breaking. Productivity was tanking. They didn't know if, if, if people are remote, are they secure, not to mention productive. And then cyber security issues just kind of kept climbing. And unfortunately that that has not stopped. And we, we were there at the right time to say, hey, yeah, we can help with this. And we ended up and we've doubled our, you know, our revenue year over year and it, it didn't stop with COVID. So we've been really fortunate. We we hired a lot through COVID as well. Um, so I mean that's kind of the you know the lesson, right? I mean that we, that we took from it of you know how can we be receptive and try to try to get ready as quick as possible when you see a need changing and an opportunity and and it's been um, a pretty steep growth curve and and a learning curve in a lot of ways too in the last two years because IT is now. Uh, the biggest part of our business. And I, I don't see that changing anytime soon. It's, it's, um, it's been really great to help yeah. businesses that way. And we, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to shift gears a little. Okay, great. Um, to go away from COVID lesson to kind of bigger picture lessons that we learned from kind of our past experience. Right. So I think some of the things that we brought when we started to build uprising from the early, you know, early days and certainly through the last couple of years, you know, are from our past experiences because we all know like throughout our careers, we see things that work really well and that we want to keep going, want to emulate, but we also have experiences that aren't so great and things that we definitely know we want to stay away from. So, you know, there are 
like five things or so that when we're really reflecting on it, that were really clear to us, this is like part of the backbone really of what we've built and, and how it's helped us grow things. So the first one is really like the hiring mentality. And this is one, I mean, all of these actually are things that I saw at Google. I absolutely um, adored my time there and, and learned so much about culture and, and creating, you know, sustainable growth, but hiring athletes is a big one. And it doesn't mean like someone who's actually physically an athlete, but people who challenge themselves, you know, their, their top competitor is themselves. They want to run at a problem. They want that challenge and they're excited to just, to get going every day. And that has been absolutely huge because, you know, when you're, when you're new or when you're building something new, it doesn't have to be a whole new company. It could be a new offering or a new team. You need people who are excited to think for themselves, who can think for themselves and they're ready to be self-starters because there's no guidebook. There's no guidebook yet. Yeah. And we, we provide our team, well, a couple, one thing back to, um, to COVID just for a second, because sure. I remember it. Yeah. Um, one of the first things we did in that first like week or two when everybody was like, hey, we all have to go remote. We don't know what this is. Uh, we went out probably way ahead of when we maybe would have, but we wanted to make sure our team, our team means everything to us. And so we went out and literally got the best healthcare plan that we possibly uh, could get, even no matter what it did to our revenue, because we wanted to make sure that, and we talked to our whole team and basically said, look, we will take pay cuts. Uh, we don't pay ourselves a ton yet, but, uh, and in fact, part of our philosophy is until we get everybody up to where they want to be, we get paid the least. So we're paid a little bit less than our lowest paid employee. And we do that on purpose and we're very open about it because we want to create a culture where everybody knows why we work so hard. And it actually works really well because everybody works so hard uh, because we're all in this together. We're all rowing the boat. So yeah, and I think, you know, that that piece with benefits goes hand in hand with with culture, right? I mean, it's how you how you treat people and how you support them because there's more to it than just supporting your team right when they're during during their work their work day. And that was another big thing that we learned from Google and VMware of, you know, to be competitive in the market too, right? And and get the best talent and to keep those people really engaged and excited. They have to have um, a great culture that is in part supported by great benefits. So we started with our uh, our simple IRA, which is a really great, you know, um, type of offering when you're, you know, a small company. That was year one that we offered that to our employees. And then uh, 2020, we did, you know, healthcare. We cover 100% of our employees' healthcare. That was a benefit that we had at VMware and Google that we really appreciated. Um, so we've been, you know, adding adding those things over time, and. You know, another thing I think that has been really great for culture, even though now that we're remote and with COVID, we went fully remote, we had an office that we shut down with COVID. Fortunately, didn't miss a beat because we, we were ready to be remote at, at any moment. Um, but now we have an office again, but people don't report here. I mean, our office is in Bethel. Our two members are um, all over the state and in other states as well. But we still make a point like once a quarter, at least to get people together in person. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the things that we do as a team to kind of keep, um, you know, keep culture yeah. in, a, in a good place. Um, one thing I think also that you do a really great job with Brian in terms of like the lessons learned from, you know, big tech, so to speak, is like taking the team on a journey. So Brian does a, a great job with kind of telling the story, right? And being a great teacher. He, he is a, an awesome mentor to all of our team members about tech in, in particular. But can you talk a little bit about like taking the team on the journey yeah. and making it meaningful and like kind of how you do that? Yeah, and, and that bleeds into some things that I think are a little uncomfortable for, for folks at times because we have had experienced people come here as well as people, and this is their first job, and to each of them for a different reason, this is very different than what either they've heard about or where they've worked before, because we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, fail quick, 
and and move on and learn from from failures. Um, one of the things I would say, and this is just sort of like how I take someone on a on a journey with us, is I once was in Vegas for a trade show. I was bored because I go to Vegas two or three times a year for different trade shows. And so what I did is I decided, I've got my pilot's license, you know, I'm going to go take this discovery course on how to fly a helicopter, right? And you're probably wondering, how does this relate to tech? We'll get there in a sec. But I got out there and I love to try everything. I love to try to be a master and like mastery of, uh, of anything I do. Um, this was one of those fails for me, though. I got out there and then I realized uh, I was going to get to fly the helicopter a lot sooner than I thought. I thought there would be like more of a uh, a lead in to like just going out there and giving it a whirl. And I got out there with the instructor and he said, OK, the stick is all yours. You know, like I gave you the couple the couple little things. Um, I want you to just like hover, you know, like four or five feet off the ground. And let's like start with that. You're right. And so I'm doing that. And then I look over. And he doesn't even have his hand on the stick. He doesn't have his hand anywhere near the stick. And I have to say, I panicked a little bit because I'm like, wow, you're, you're way too trusting with too much. And I got the wobbles and I thought we were done. I thought I had put the rotor in the ground and I literally, I somehow managed to like recover it. And I looked over and that guy didn't even move his hands from his lap. And I was like, hey, did you just happen to see what happened? I thought I killed us, right? And he basically said, look, that was nerving, nerve wracking to you, but I knew we had a lot more to go before we were in trouble. And you would have seen my hands go to the stick when we were at the last like 10% where I had to jump in. And after that, I was like, "Good, I'm good. I never have to fly a helicopter again. I'm going to cross that off the list. I feel like a little bit of a fail on that, but I finally found like the boundary where I'm like, I'm not comfortable. And so I thought a lot about that. And that's a lot about how we teach tech here. We get people on, on the program, right? Is give people space to make some mistakes. There are times where I would sit on my hands and watch someone working on something. And I gave them some guidance and we got going. And just like that helicopter experience for me, I let them get to the point where they scared themselves a little bit. And Melinda would ask me, hey, how long would it have taken you to do that? You just gave them like a week to figure it out or whatever. And I said, I already did it. It took me like 10 minutes, but this isn't about me. Who cares how quick I could do it for us to grow as a company? We really need to be able to get other people comfortable with flying the helicopter. And so we provide that ability to, you know, fail a little bit, feel uncomfortable, and that's okay. And if it takes longer and all of that, the only way that person gets quicker is by doing it and feeling like they did it on them, did it on their own, right? And so that's like a, a big thing that we push and present here as we learn new technology together as as all of that. Yeah. So so want to shift gears again and and give some kind of tips, tricks, tools that um, that that anyone could use with a small, medium-sized business um, and want to also relate it to what this series is going to be addressing, right? So cybersecurity, managing a remote team. Um, and in terms of tech trends and what we see, um, we have a few quick tips that we'd love to share that can help an organization shore up their security actually really quickly. And before we jump in to the tips, uh, I'd love to do a, a quick poll. If we can pull that up, there is a- um, You're fancier than I am. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is all Brooke with the magic behind the poll. So, um, here is the question. So what percent of small businesses think they're too small for a cyber attack? So you want to sing the Jeopardy's, the Jeopardy music? And the poll should be open for you guys to go ahead and put your answers in now. So everyone can go ahead and enter those in. I think for the sake of everybody, I'm not going to sing. This one here is actually the, the good singer. 
Next. All right. Are the results coming in, Brooke? You know what? I'm, let me relaunch it because I'm having oh, an yeah. issue. I'm not no sure. Worries. Launch poll. Let's see. It says it's launching, but I don't know if it is. Oh my goodness. I don't think I saw it launch. I hit launch poll, but of course it's speaking That's of okay. chat. I can uh, um I can well, just I can share the screen and you can tell us. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll uh people can put it in the chat. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I know you're all at the edge of your seats wondering. Okay. So the answer, this is the honor system. If you got it right or not, you can like put a thumbs up in the chat. Um, so it's 54%. And what we have um, seen time and time again is that actually half of um, all cyber attacks happen to small businesses. And it's not a matter of, you know, thinking, oh, I'm immune because who wants my data? Well, unfortunately, we're seeing a ton of ransomware. Uh, just a couple of customers that are new to us in the last month are coming to us for help to recover from a ransomware issue. And it can be quite devastating. Of course, losing your data is one thing, but also a lot of organizations pay that ransom. And uh, sometimes that's, an, that's enough of a dollar amount that will actually put them out of business as well. So, the, you know, this is something that we, you know, un unfortunately today is something we need to take seriously, even though it's not something we see, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so Brian, what are a few quick tips that a business can can put in place to get security in, in a much better place? Yeah, so the really simple things, and everybody hears this, right? Having a strong password. And what I would say is, I at last look, I've got 379 passwords right now. Obviously, that's to get into a ton of different systems that we use and a number of different you know, software platforms. Uh, what I would say, I can't remember any of those. I have one password that I remember that is good and long and uh, something that's actually a phrase uh, with some numbers mixed in uh, that I change on a fairly frequent basis. But I know one password. And so I use something called LastPass. There's other tools just like it, uh, but I use that so that I can rotate those passwords and I don't know all but my password to get into LastPass. And we use that throughout our, our whole team. And yep. we actually do password security checks every month to make sure everyone is keeping up to date with their password hygiene. So, um, yeah, and the great part about that is it lets us as business owners look and see if people are reusing passwords places. We actually have like inside, you know, uh, awards and, and things like that. We also probably have the, uh, you know, the, the not great award as well when someone's real low on the list, but uh, for the most part, um, great mug, by the way. Um, but for the most part, we're always testing that and checking that to make sure people aren't reusing passwords everywhere. It's human nature, right? And that is the, the next piece, right? Human nature is you make a password that you can remember. I go to a lot of different businesses and I'm talking about good password hygiene and the basics, right? And I will flip over a keyboard usually in that conversation to say, and this is where a lot of people hide it. Two out of three places I go to, I do that. That is where there is a password on a post-it note. Uh, and it's always something that's, uh, that's pretty critical. So think of passwords that are really good and long, more than 20 characters. It's got some numbers, symbols, and whatever. Um, and But that's not enough anymore, because if you think about that password, uh, if you're allowing access from anywhere in the world, uh, now someone could be trying your password or you know what they call brute force, where they just keep trying a password until they can get in. Uh, and if you're not paying attention to that and seeing that in the logs, they might have an infinite number of times that they could try to log in to your system and try to change your password. So insert MFA, multi-factor authentication. Uh, multi-factor authentication, that's where you get that little rotating code that you've got to enter in as well. There are some other implementations of that, but that is a really good thing. That is going to cut down your chances of getting hacked just by someone, you know, brute forcing into your password. Uh, that's going to, those two things by themselves are going to get you pretty far down the scale as far as being more secure. Uh, one of the other pieces is as you grow as a business, 
everybody doesn't need to have the same level of access. The person that runs accounting probably doesn't need all of the sales information. The salesperson doesn't probably need all the accounting information. Setting up your privileges and permissions so that that is the case also limits how much if someone does pick up a virus or pick up malware or ransomware, it's going to limit how far that that machine can actually get and hopefully not encrypt everything uh, in your infrastructure. Uh, another big one is everybody sees Windows updates and, and Mac OS updates. Make sure you're doing those on a regular basis. Uh, that is really critical. New security patches are coming out uh, almost daily at this point. And so that's really important. But the one that a lot of people miss is all of your different applications. Those actually have to get updated too. So if you've got Microsoft Office or you've got Adobe products or what have you, those don't always get updated with that Windows or Mac updater. So make sure you're looking at those as well uh, or have someone that, uh, that does know how to do that and make sure that you're getting those patches. Um, and then the last piece is team awareness. So over 90% of ransomware and malware gets into someone's organization through email, right? And so that's a really big number. And so that means that it is not a matter of if you get hacked, it's a matter of when. And I don't say that to, to scare folks. I say that so that a good reaction and a good plan built ahead of time is really gonna go far. Um, most of the time, uh, some of our customers that became customers after they got ransomware, they stuff sat for a very long time and they had been hacked for months and they didn't know it. And then stuff started getting encrypted and then they got you know notices that they had been hacked. Uh, that happened over a very long period of time. It's hard to you know sort of react and recover from that. Uh, the other piece to that is when you think about that, Today, in 2021, 64% of the people that had all of the right security things done, 40, you know, whatever, 30, uh, 36% of those still got hacked and they had a bunch of that stuff in place. And it's because it's really hard for the human factor to not click on things sometimes. And some of these uh, emails that have malware or phishing or, or all of the other terms uh, they're getting really good. So one of the things that we do is we send out test emails that look like an Amex, you know, password change, or, you know, looks like something from Microsoft that's prompting you to change your password. Um, and we do that not because we're trying to trick our team. We use that for training so that if someone does click on that link, rather than opening, you know, malware, they're actually going and getting training, right? It's going to send them right off to training. And then they're going to be able to just sort of better their skills. And so this is an evolving threat. Um, once or twice a week, we get we get stuff that, you know, is skeptical. And we look at it and we talk to our team about figuring out, does this, is this real or is this not, excuse me, is this not? Um, but yeah, so those are a couple tips that I would say are are really important. If you're doing those, you're going to be fairly safe. If you're not doing those, you probably are going to need a, a tune-up so that um, you have more resilience. That's so. great. And uh, we actually just published a blog on those those tips as well. Uh, if you want to read read more about them, um, that's a that's a quick a quick read. And just to wrap up, um, I also wanted to make a little um, note on a few of the additional things that we do to help us manage a remote team. We talked about some of those things before in terms of you know, culture. Yes, we have a remote team, but we still get together in person once in a while. That's all really important. Um, benefits is really important, right? It's all wrapped into culture. And also thinking about flexibility. That's one of the things that everyone has really appreciated with remote work, um, the flexibility to live where you want to live. You know, growing up in Bethel, I, I mean, I never thought I would live here as an adult. I, there, there wasn't something here that before I created it, that allowed me to you know grow in that way. So you know that's this is the wonderful thing about remote work that people can live where they love to live but still do inspiring work. 
and you know how do we encourage you know more of that so you know we of course have to have set hours so we have collaboration time we have to have people managing our service desk so when IT um, tickets come in those are are responded to really quickly but we can offer flexibility as well and you know all of that works when you have really solid communication and this is something that we work on actively all the time with our team uh, we use Microsoft Teams for, for chat. You know, we have a, a nice structure so everyone knows where to go uh, to share information and to find information. Uh, we have some standing meetings that I think are, are very useful. And we've heard feedback that from, from other people outside of our team that they've adopted some of these things. So I'll, I'll give a few examples. Can you talk about stand up? Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. And like the principles behind it. So we operate off of an agile planning method. So it's a software engineering type of method, but it can be applied to really anything. But basically part of that is having daily standups. It's 15 minutes where the team gets on a call and it's very structured because it ha if it's more than 15 minutes, you're starting to waste your time. So it's, what did I accomplish in the last 24? Like quick hit. What am I going to accomplish in the next 24? What are my blockers? Like what's keeping me from moving forward? What do I need for my team? And if any discussions need to happen, you note that and you say, okay, let's park it. We'll deal with that after the meeting. But it keeps everybody on the same page with the top priorities. If a priority is missing, it allows us to talk about that and, and make sure we're on the same page. And sharing those blockers is huge. So we know how to collaborate. Uh, we also have a Monday all hands. So that's more strategic conversation, right? I mean, a couple weeks ago, we had a refresher on what does confidentiality mean at Uprise, right? Not exactly, that's an exciting one, but important, right? We talk about what we're doing for the upcoming week, right? Bigger picture. And then every Friday, we do something called celebrations and lessons learned. And it's at 1230. We used to have it at the end of the day, but the team really preferred to have it a little earlier so they don't have that like exhausted Friday brain going into this. But it's nothing we prepare for. Well, we literally just go around and everyone says a few things about what they learned that week and what they're celebrating. So celebrating, you know, something with a project, celebrating another team member, whatever that may be. Again, totally informal, off the cuff, but it's such a nice way to reflect on the week and share with the team. And it's been something that we've we've kind of revisited multiple times. Say, hey, is this still working? Do we still like it? And the team like resoundingly says like, well, we love it. We keep, We want to keep doing it. So those touch points help us stay close, you know, even though we're remote. And I would say when we first started, it was sort of at the beginning of COVID. And so, and we've carried on this tradition. Typically, uh, we usually have an adult beverage at hand just to kind of like lighten the mood a little bit. And it's also the time where um, I think the one thing that a lot of people like is that it gives them a chance to reflect it. It gives them a chance to talk about the things also that didn't go yeah. real great. And we lead from there, right? I usually have uh, something in my week that didn't go according to plan. I'm in technology, right? So that that's pretty typical, but um, we try to lead by example so that other people feel comfortable to talk about the things that also didn't go well. And that's the lesson learned, right? So, so um, let's close with one final poll. If you wouldn't mind bringing up the second poll question. So, um, Reflecting on remote work, what percentage of working adults work remotely at least sometimes? Sorry, guys, I'm trying to launch it again and I hit launch and it grays out. I don't think it, you guys are able to see it. I don't know what's going on, but all good. Um, we'll give everyone technology a is wonderful. But <laughs> that's why you have redundancy. You're doing it exactly right, Brooke, because we have it on the slide. We are all good. We have All some, right, so, some so. chat coming in though. We have a few people saying 62%. Then we have uh, someone saying 82%. So we are getting some engagement in the chat. All right, drum roll, 62%. Nice. You got it. And, it, and that Prizes is changing. for those of you who got it, actually. I don't know if we have prizes. It, and I would say that's changing daily because a lot of big companies out there are starting to realize productivity has maybe slid a little bit. Uh, Tesla just announced yesterday they're making all execs come back to uh, the office. What I would say is, uh, we actually this was a, this was big for us because working remote and letting our team work remote, uh, we've gotten really the best out of out of everybody, and everybody loves it. 
uh, if that didn't work for big companies, sometimes uh, the politics of it uh, and everything gets gets wrapped in there. But for the most part, we definitely feel like it's a major advantage for us, especially being in Maine. So absolutely. So with that, I'd love to see if anyone has questions. We're happy to, um, you know, speak to anything. I know we covered. I know we covered a lot and zigged and zagged here. So happy to revisit anything that you have questions on. If we don't have any questions yet, I do want to ask one. This is Brooke. I don't know if you guys can see me. <laughs> um, so during our prep call, we talked a lot about your uniqueness of being a husband and wife. Um, team uh, of leadership and you know the institute for family owned business a lot of our members are family businesses so they might not necessarily be husband and wife but maybe they're there's um parents and siblings and cousins and all types of nature what would be your best advice to those family businesses who are you know trying to do their business but also dealing with the family element as well yeah can i, can I take this one sure <laughs> I, think the, I think the one thing that we did to keep this reasonable, right? Because at the end of the day, this is the most important to us. Uh, our business is important, but if we're not good, the business isn't good. So one of the things that we kind of determined early on was, look, if we're going to do this together, we A, have to make sure we've got a good plan so that if one of us decides, hey, this doesn't work you know, for us anymore, it's okay. We can we could kind of continue and and have contu you know continuity in the business. But the other part is we kind of came up with a with a phrase that um, so that we don't forget that you know we're husband and wife also, and that we're running a business. And that is, are you talking to me as my spouse right now, or are you talking to me as the co leader of this business? And that works really well for us. And I actually haven't found a time where it hasn't because there are times you just get passionate about business and there's a lot of stressors with business uh, and we just want to make sure we're not like blurring the lines and like sort of overstepping and that works really well for us I, I agree and I think I think that is is the most important thing to think about with a with a family business of you actually are working with people that you have you know multiple roles with right a and and as you would interact, it's not like you become a different person, of course, like, no, you always want to be you and, 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 and um, you know, go with that. But how I talk with Brian as his colleague, his work colleague might be different than as his spouse. So for, to give an example, you know, if we're like, you know, cooking dinner and talking about something with the business and this example has come up, you know, Brian would go into, for example, like problem solving mode. Right. And then I would have to be like, oh, wait, no, I'm just talking to you as like, as your spouse right now. I just want to like vent and get it out. I don't want to like solve a problem. I don't want to have to make a note. I don't want to have to think about follow-up. Like, no, I just want to talk right now. You know, the engineer in me wants to solve and, everything immediately. <laughs> and that's a, that's a wonderful quality. Right. But those are like different, it's a different space and a different role. So I think if you can think about, well, what is my role within the company? What does my company need of me in that role versus what does is, what is my family need of me and how is that role at, at home different? Then you can like know when you want to kind of switch on and off, right? Because we have times too in the evening where we're like, okay, no more work, like it's done, right? And and then we catch ourselves slipping because you always do, right? But but being conscious of it is is the biggest thing, I think. So we had one more question from uh, uh, from Erica. She said, you mentioned five backbone issues to uprise and began with one, hiring mentality athletes and two, be superior benefits. And then what were the other three? Yeah, so so the third is like taking people on the, on the journey. And, and part of that is, is the fourth one of really making the organization feel flat. So having that communication where, you know, even your most junior team members can feel empowered to give feedback and talk with, um, you know, senior leaders on the team. And, you know, we're a small company, so that has come pretty naturally for us, but that's something that we really want to 
keep going. And the third one is again, I'm sorry, the fifth one is also really related to that benefits portion of the program of, you know, when you're taking people on the journey, it's also part of giving them um, part of that long-term success. And I'm so glad you asked this question because this was something that we didn't talk about with benefits. Um, we actually give everybody at the company equity. So when, if someday we sell, everyone shares in that success. So, you know, we want people to understand how their role on a daily basis ladders up to the bigger vision as well as benefit from that, you know, when that time comes. Okay, so we're right at time now. So um, we've put the survey link in for this program. Please let us know what you think, if you could give us a minute, because that's how we plan our programs. I want to thank our sponsor, MassFed, and I want to thank you guys for coming on and speaking and telling us about your background and what you've done and tips. It's, a, it's wonderful. And um, we'll keep this survey and this open so that you guys can go and click in there. And, um, and in three weeks, we'll be back here, same time, same station on June 23rd, and we'll get more into those cybersecurity. You set the stage and you told us a little bit about, you know, security and what to do, but we will have cyber um, tech, we'll have cyber insurance, we'll have bankers, and we'll have Derek Boat to tell us about how he said it's like going to the dentist, but you really need to do it. <laughs> and um, and we, uh, we just really appreciate everybody. We'll have a follow-up email that will have this recording and that tips in your blog that you had. And if anybody has any other questions, um, we'll have their contact information so you can connect with um, Brian and Melinda. So thank you all very much and have a, have a great day. The sun's coming out here. So hopefully it is where you are too. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks thank so you. much, Catherine. Thanks Brooke. Thank you. Good job.